Good morning, good morning, good morning. How do you like my new glasses? Good, aren't they? Mind my wood. So, should we go the windy bends? Should we go the fast way? Let's go the windy bends. I, you know, you know, don't you? That I prefer the windy bends. It's a bit more, uh, you know, scenic. Right. Now it's July. So because it's third week in July, of course it's raining. Although you will see some blue sky. There's a bit of blue sky up there to the left, I can see it. Don't know if you can see it. You can see it when we come around this bend. Anyway, how are you? Hope you're well. I'm well. We're still working away. Ooh. My back windscreen wipe is a bit scratchy. Look at, look at that beautiful blue sky. Shame it's over there, isn't it? Not over here. Yeah, we're, uh, we're getting ready to have a couple of weeks off in August. We're at a funny, we're at a funny stage. Because you know we, I don't know, two cyclists. Seriously? Or three people? I mean, I think this is lovely. I think it's lovely that women cycle their children to school. I just wouldn't do it on this road. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I'm not going to overtake her because that's a blind right hand bend. There might be something coming up the other side. So. Don't want to get too close. Now we've got a blind left hand bend. Shut up. Right, now we've got a bit of... I know you're saying it's a blind right hand bend, but I have actually looked up the road and I could see that there was nothing on it. Oh my God, that was a bit of drama, wasn't it? A bit of drama there. Was I going to kill a woman and her child on a cycle? You notice these roads, they haven't even got pavements, right? Otherwise she would have been on the pavement. You don't even see pedestrians walking these roads. But I suppose, you know, okay, you want to get fit. They're all over the place, these women. So anyway, dentistry, dentistry. What's up with dentistry? Do you know it's just the massivest long period that I've ever been through with absolutely nothing happening at all. We've got a system in that isn't working, that's obviously broken and it's breaking down. And uh, we've just had a change of government, as expected the Labour Party has, uh, has won with a massive majority. Yeah, you're going left, but I decided not to indicate, that's fine. So, you know, what's the Labour Party policy on uh, on dentistry? Well, to, to be honest with you, I'm not even going to go into it. It's, it's so painfully ridiculous. As was the Conservatives' policy. I mean, the, the I think that all you need to know about politics at the moment is that the the population decided after 14 years that it's going to put the... Uh, why don't you just slow down and go round the inside of the corner, you pillock, instead of pulling out. Oh, anyway. I can make those comments. I used to be a cyclist, so I know I can. I can. You know, I know. I know you can tell from the... But... So the... the, the, the population decided that the Conservatives deserve five, five years on the naughty step and that they don't care who they're going to vote for. In fact, they didn't have anybody to vote for. Hence the large number who voted for the Liberal Democrats because they're like, well, we've got nobody to vote for. We might as well vote for someone we've never voted for. 
So Farage got more votes than the Liberal Democrats, but got no, practically no seats. The Democrats, the Democrats got got fewer votes than Farage and, and got a ton of seats. This is how crazy our system is. So, uh, what can we make of it all? You know, what's what, what's, how is it going to affect dentistry? Well, it's all macroeconomic, I think. I don't think, you know, this idea of giving dentists golden hellos and uh, various, various sort of uh, interference in a micromanagerial type way into the services is not going to make any difference. Let's not forget that it was the change, the macro economic change to the UDA system, to in, you know, into the UDA system, that caused the um, the gradual collapse of NHS provision in any case. So, are we? Can we expect another change of that magnitude? You know, which and at the moment, the only change of any magnitude that I can think that might solve the system will be to literally go back to the system as it was in 1988. Or the system as it was in uh, even 1984, 1982, when I qualified, you know, a fee for item type system. But I can't, uh, you know, I can't see anyone with any imagination coming forward because Policy in dentistry, as we all know now, is is driven by the chief dental officer. It was when I qualified; it used to be driven by the secretary of state for health, and then it was handed down to uh, the ministers for health, the Rosie Winstons of the world. And when they decided that they couldn't cope with it, it was all um, they just said to the they appointed a chief dental officer who was there who was their man, you know, and said, uh, well, you, you know, you're a dentist, you know about dentistry, fix it. <laughs> and of course, Cockcroft wasn't a, he was a dentist, and I'm sure he knew about dentistry, but he, he, he knew enough all about how to uh, run the system in a way that would provide dentistry reasonably cost-effectively, and and uh, uh, you know, and reliably. So they brought in this, I don't know what you'd call it, it's a UDA system. And uh, you know, and we told them it wasn't going to work and it didn't work and it hasn't worked. So, and so now we've got, so we've got nothing going on. There's nothing in the pipeline on the treatment provision system front. So what, what about the other fronts, you know, the macroeconomic front and stuff like that? Well, there's an increased demand among the public for uh, state provision of everything. They want the state to provide them with everything. Uh, food if they can't afford it through food banks, accommodation through council housing or, or subsidised you know, what they call affordable housing, um, and pretty much everything, healthcare, education, you name it, uh, uh, fire, foreign wars, not so popular amongst the population, but, you know, people are, see their money being siphoned off in that way. And every problem in society is dealt with by another demand on the government to do something about it with a capital S. Well, the current uh, thing that they're banging on about is uh, the fact that you can get child benefit for one or two children, but if you've got three or four or more children, you, you don't get child benefit for the third, fourth or whatever child. There's a, basically there's a cap on two children for the purposes of child benefit. Now, I mean, this is, goes back a bit to the Tories idea that you know, the lower class are, are breeders 
and uh, they shouldn't be rewarded for having massive families, which then have to be paid for by the state. So they sort of were quite happy uh, theoretically with you know limiting benefits to children to those who just had two children you know the typical happy mum dad boy and a girl so but the problem the Labour government's got is they've got two problems one is that they can't afford it or, or I'll just come back to that the second problem is that it, it would take half a million children out of poverty and that really obviously depends on what your definition of poverty is but by the current definition apparently half a million children will be taken out of poverty if they abolish that it's only a few hundred quid but each but you know it takes them over the line the finish line <coughs> and then <clears throat> But the problem of affordability is that they did say, before they got elected, that they wouldn't do it because they can't say where the money would come from. And for Labour governments, this is always a big problem because I remember my parents saying to me, Labour government, tax and spend, tax and spend, that's all they do. And uh, so, and that's, to, to be honest with you, that's mostly what they've done. And it's mostly what the Conservatives didn't do until the last decade in where, where you know where they got elected and you know for some reason through fiscal uh, responsibility to the winds and just decided to spend money like a, a bunch of drunken sailors and that's why uh, we got the inflation that we have and why um, the country's in a dire situation in terms of its its current account surplus or deficit and uh, uh, balance balance sheet, uh, you know, owing owing 100% of the of the country's income GDP. So, so we've got a choice between two tax and spend uh, governments, and I think people. That's why I say they looked at it and said, well, for this election, to be honest with you, it doesn't matter who we vote for. So we'd rather vote for the other lot because then. Um, the, the Tories will possibly, possibly, not at all probably, but possibly decide that they want to think about some principles such as balancing the budget and going back to this will be this will be great, going back to some sort of hard money uh, uh, sort of. Uh, Milton Friedman type the economics and throw Keynes, Keynesianism out the window, this spending, spending, spending. What was it, the Vivian Nichols approach to government? <laughs> so Labour has got this like, this reputation which they've never lived down for just uh, solving everything by government spending. Um, and they've started to, well, to give them their due, they did realise a few years ago that uh, they, they, they got to tackle this perception by the public of them as uh, spending money they haven't got or not likely to get and um, and so this is why they put their foot down on child benefit they said no we're not going to spend it because it's an unfunded spending commitment we're not going to say we're going to spend anything unless we know where the funding's coming from well, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's about five billion, which I tend to be honest with you, in terms of the government, that's probably a bit of a, it's a rounding error, really, in terms of their budget, but we'll leave them open to a massive amount of criticism if they suddenly caved, because it would look like the first thing they did when they got into government was come under a bit of pressure and immediately caved and uh, decided to spend some money that they said they weren't going to spend and haven't got. So there's no way they're going to do that. But then on the other hand, they've got this half a million children out of poverty problem, uh, which and uh, people saying, well, what's the Labour government for? If it's not to get half a million children out of poverty straight away. 
what they would rather do, and I think, and I would rather they did, was made everybody more prosperous. And that would lift everybody out of poverty, wouldn't it? It would, you know, rising boats and all that. But uh, making everybody more prosperous is not really on the agenda at the moment. Because as we have discussed in the past on Economics with Angry, the, uh, the, the amount of money that they've already printed and the debt, the interest they have to pay on the debt, and that means that they've got um, a problem with inflation. Inflation, the money supply has been inflated, purchasing power of pounds gone down, the, uh, which means prices for everything have gone up and they can't afford to put interest rates up higher than inflation because that's the classic way you would control inflation is to put interest rates up higher. So if inflation is at two, you want in interest rates at four. If inflation is at five, you want interest rates at 10. And that keeps inflation down by changing people's behavior because if interest rates are higher than inflation, then what you tend to do is you tend to uh, save. You tend to say, oh, I won't buy that thing now. I'll, I'll put the money in the bank and save because I'll be better able to afford it later. Whereas if it's the other way around and inflation is higher than interest rates, then the same decision goes a different way. The decision then becomes I'll take my money out of the bank and buy that thing now because if I don't, now it's cheaper whereas if I wait it's going to be cost less it's going to cost me more I'm going to need more money to buy it later because the inflation's eating away at the value of the pound so my purchasing power is going down so I need to use it right now and of course that's a vicious circle because the minute everybody decides that they're going to buy everything they need for the next year now then uh, that increases demand. You get a demand shock and prices go up. So what they've done is they've come up with something which, um, you know, to be fair, these people with the money, they're, they're nothing if not ingenious. They've come up with a dual policy, which is to raise in interest rates a bit, a bit, not higher than inflation, but just a bit. High enough to uh, suppress demand a bit. But on the other hand, the second, the second, uh, you know, that's the left uppercut and the right cross is to um, make people poorer. So they've increased the tax burden on everybody. So everybody's suffering. They're suffering from high interest rates on the one hand, not as high as they could be, but higher, higher. And on the other side, they've got uh, the wages aren't going up. And w when they do earn any money, they're, um, you know, they find their capital gains allowance has gone down from twelve to six to three thousand pounds a year. And they find <clears throat> that although they're paying slightly less national insurance they've gone up into a higher tax bracket because they are not um, putting the tax brackets up in line with inflation. So you've got a you've got a double whammy there. You've got basically what you've got is higher interest rates which influence the way that people spend and a supply and a, and a demand shock uh, but you know through higher taxes which means that Although people do see possibly that it might be in their interest to, to, to buy something now, they just don't have the money to do it. And what that means is they don't have to put interest rates up quite as high as they would if they were relying on interest rates alone. Uh, so, and that's necessary because at the moment, the person or the sector that is in the biggest debt is the government. You know, it's a bit like uh, after the Second World War, if you're looking at various periods in time that are similar to now, 
after the Second World War, the government was in debt uh, because of the cost of fighting the war. Now, the period that everyone compares now with is the 70s because most people who are alive can't really remember the inflation after the Second World War or how, how the government reduced the debt. Uh, but we were still on the gold standard, so they had no um, option of just inflating it away, which is what they're doing um, now. But in the 70s, people are, well, we had high inflation in the 70s, etc., etc. et cetera. They, they, they talk about it like having the flu, you know, as though they don't really understand where it came from. They don't understand that it came from government printing of money. And of course, that's quite understandable because no one's telling them that. <laughs> well, I'm the only fucker telling them. The mainstream media is saying, calling it Putin's inflation or saying that it's a, it's a supply shock from the Ukraine war, even though gas prices are at the same or lower than they were before the Ukraine war and, and, and Russian sanctions and stuff like that. And we get most of our gas from Norway, not not Russia. You know, Germany was more affected by it than we were in that respect. So, we are not going to get thrust into the sunlit uplands of wealth anytime soon. And by any time soon, I mean any time foreseeable. You know, I mean, there, there are several ways that systems get changed. The reason why, uh, incidentally, why we're not like the 70s now is because in the 70s, um, the Nixon had taken the United States off the gold standard, in effect, refused to convert, uh, they used to convert dollars to gold on request. And then, he, and then after the the fight in the side of the Vietnam War and everything and it all became untenable and uh, gold was changing hands at $800 an ounce on the private market and, and $35 an ounce uh, in a, on the government market and so you know France I think it was turned up at, uh, at, the, at the till and said to uh, Nixon we'd like a load of gold please at $35 an ounce and he was like, well, can't be done. Sorry, mate. But in those days, the post-70s was all about corporate debt. It was the private sector that owned the debt. You know, they, they were the ones that were massively over-leveraged. Um, unlike in the 40s when it was the government that was over-leveraged. And that's what it's like now. The private, there are zombie companies who can't, who could only pay, who could only keep going because they were paying the interest on their debt when it was like 0%. And now interest rates are going up and they're having to refinance. More and more of them obviously are gonna collapse. But the biggest uh, debtors at the moment, or the biggest debtor is the government. And that's why the government can't allow interest rates to go up to 10% uh, or whatever, you know, to conquer inflation. 4% is, is is you know pretty much on the edge of what's been, what's affordable for them. So uh, yeah, so no uh, no hope and no hope in sight. As afraid is the message today. But um, if I think of anything, uh, you know, I, I, there are some good things about dentistry that mean that we are going to be a little bit immune to this. So perhaps I'll cover those on the way home. Okay, nice to talk to you. Bye.